we thought we'd spice things up a bit. <laughs> Actually, Ghoul didn't think I had what it took, so I'm proving him wrong. <laughs> this Dr. Ghoul show, we start off with the patient and where am I going, Ghoul? Then our fiendish friend Slash Apo tells us a tale that will tickle your scary endorphins. Can't be seen has more fun bat facts to share. <laughs> and I, the phenomenal Scrog, will share my own story as only can be done in my style. <laughs> and of course, Dr. Ghoul gets to close the show with a story about witches. <laughs> so, enjoy the show, and let's allow the patient to tell us his new woes. <laughs> Now I know, Ghoul. You've worked your magic, Ghoul. Everyone in the institution is treating me kindly. Not like I have been treated by the staff in the past. They all seem to have a relaxed attitude about my presence. Our little nurse tells me with a note she is being promoted to assistant dietitian here at the institution. The physical therapy has been ramped up with a lot of walking and climbing exercises and light weights to build muscle back where I had atrophied from lack of movement. The shrink who has been my doctor has quit the institution according to the PT because of me and retired from the practice. I must admit I am pleased by this piece of information you know, Ghoul, I dislike head doctors. Now I am curious, Ghoul. Where are they taking me? Will this be my opportunity to escape, Ghoul? Are you planning to make sure I don't escape, Ghoul, from here or any other mental hospital? Is that, if that is the case, you're in for more than I think you think I am capable of, Ghoul. The institution has backed off strong meds because I learned how to comply with their wishes. The fools. So where am I going, ghoul? Is this a trick? Are people just allowing me more grace because they have another place to send me? Will my new prison? That's right, ghoul. This has been like a prison. Be anything like where I reside now. You know me, Ghoul, so I won't disclose any plans that you can circumvent. You and I have our moments, Ghoul. Someday we will have a sumptuous dinner together and drink the best wine available. I feel freedom is close, Ghoul. I am a little concerned about where they are taking me, though. What if you abandon me? What if this is the last time we communicate? You wouldn't abandon me, right, Ghoul? I am your pet project, aren't I? Aren't we friends? Are you my guardian angel? <laughs> Ghoul, don't you think being compared to an angel is funny? I've never known you to be angelic, Ghoul. For some reason, I wish my meds were stronger. Today, paranoia seems to be creeping in. Talking abandonment brings up unpleasant memories. Is this what it's going to be, my fate, paranoia for the rest of my life? I have no control over my situation as far as my residence is concerned. You have had a giant part of that, ghoul. Please, do not leave me, ghoul. I am begging you, don't abandon me. I am not sure where my mind will go without your communication. Where am I going, ghoul? Strangleland.
It's been ten days since the retirement home bus went missing with thirteen senior citizens on board. It was supposed to be a simple trip to Las Vegas and then back to Los Angeles. Halfway into the trip, in a deserted area, they hit a pothole and blew a left front tire. The bus driver said, Remain calm to everybody. It's just a flat tire. I will have it fixed in a minute, and we will be on our way. Tim Gavel, better known as Big Grim Tim, the bus driver, was known for his towering frame and scraggly black hair. With an appearance like Lurt from Adam's family, he was very intimidating as well as shy. The bus lifted three feet when Tim walked off the bus to check the tire. The old man and woman would heckle about how he stunk and how insufferable his music was on the trip. They began to even make remarks about his teeth and hair asking him, Hey Sonny, why don't you get a haircut? Hey boy, do you need a toothbrush? Tim was very shy and sensitive. His towering frame was intimidating to most. The senior citizens on board were not afraid of anything. They were some of the most ruthless senior citizens in Beverly Hills. Each senior citizen on this bus was very rich and very well corrupt. Outside of the bus, Tim began to change the tire, when out of nowhere, he was blindsided by a piece of concrete from the oncoming car. It hit him and knocked him back, gashing a nice form on his brow. Blood began running down his face. He began to hear a loud ringing sound, as well as visions of mutilated corpses and human sacrifices. An uncontrollable desire crept over him like a spider. He began having flashbacks of the senior citizens heckling him, criticizing him and degrading him. He started to shake, as well as the raining intensified in his ears. He sat up from the ground and walked directly back onto the bus. Janet DeLong loved to degrade everybody. As soon as Tim laid eyes on her, her first words were, You need a band-aid, baby? As the blood spewed down Tim's face, a flashing white light burst into his mind like a volcano erupting. When Tim opened his eyes, he seen all the faces of the senior citizens looking at him in disgust and curiosity. To their amazement, the inside of the bus began to shift and change into a circus tent. A putrid smell began to fill the air inside of the bus. Big Grim Tim was now fully engulfed in a blue flame with a top hat and staff in hand. He shouted from the top of his lungs, Welcome to Strangle Land! And with a snap of his fingers, the seat belts from their seats wrapped tightly around each one of their throats. Grim Tim began parading up and down the aisles like a marching band, mocking the senior citizens with their own words. Want a toothbrush? He chuckled in a high-pitched Jamaican voice. He began dancing around in circles, and evidently all the passengers were all hanging by their safety straps and all thirteen citizens kicking and thrashing, choking to death. 
parading up and down the aisles, he began to sing, Welcome to Strangleland. I hope you enjoyed that story. Next up is Can't Be Seen with Fun Bat Facts. Enjoy, ghoulies. Howdy, guys. It's me with that lilting voice. Can't be seen. And Ghoul's gonna let me do fun bad facts again. <laughs> bad fact number one. There are three species of vampire bats and they are only found in Mexico, Central America, and South America. They are very small bats and typically only drink one tablespoon of blood each feeding. They prey mostly on cows. They are very social bats. They have been seen feeding other bats that couldn't care for themselves, even in their own detriment. Bat fact number two. Bats have been detected flying over 50 miles per hour. Some have even been detected flying over 3,000 feet above the ground in search of insects. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of vision? Hmm. Bat fact number three. Most bats have one pup a year. Some commonly have twins. A few bats have been known to have three or four or even five pups a year. Tropical fruit bats usually have a baby twice a year. Fun bat fact number five. The oldest bat fossil ever found was in Wyoming and is estimated to be 52 million years old. And our final bat fact of the day, most bats live to be 10 or 20 years. The oldest bat known lived to be 41 years old. Now I wonder who his friend was to count that many years. <laughs> Can be seen out with fun bad facts coming your way another time. An acquaintance, don't ask me how, acquired the ingredients and correct measurements for a concoction we'll just call Jekyll Punch. <laughs> I asked what he was going to do with it since his last name wasn't Hyde. Then I chuckled a bit. <laughs> he found no humor and looked at me sternly and said, Scrog, you fool, this is nothing to be cynical about. He continued, I would like to observe someone under the influence of this potion. I even thought I should be the one to drink the potion, or elixir, or serum, or whatever it is called, he added. He realized he couldn't be the one who drank it. How would he observe what the reaction was, or properly record, if any? extreme changes in his own personality. He needed a volunteer. <laughs> Since this acquaintance was not a doctor of any sort, I asked why did he want to know. Again, a severely stern look, he said. To prove to all he was only a fictional character, he ranted. No human being could go through that kind of monstrous change and then go back to his normal self. He quickly produced a test tube filled with the liquid in it. From its color, it appeared to be urine. I immediately thought, oh, this is just a very poor, sick joke. But as he, as he set down a test tube stand, he produced a second test tube. This liquid was purple in color and looked like grape juice. 
He placed both in the stand and looked at me with a wry smirk on his face. He said, Scrog, you seem curious about life and its oddities. I held up my hands and said, I will drink neither liquid. He confessed he thought not. He explained the yellow liquid was the potion and the purple liquid was the anecdote. And the antidote too. He grabbed the yellow bottle, pulled the cork out and promptly drank it. Hurry, he said. We must go to my basement if only takes a short time to take effect. If I have an extreme reaction, please take this syringe and fill it with the antidote. As we got to the basement, a cage was there set up. He insisted I lock him in. I screamed, tell me this is a joke. Locked in a cage, he told me to take notes of all you see, please. Again, I screamed, are you crazy? He looked straight at me, and he just stared. This man, although not a true friend, was extremely bright. His family were all wealthy professionals. He himself was a fiduciary for a large non-profit. Now this man just stared at me, but not for long. He let out a scream, Aah! as if he were an impaled animal. I ran upstairs and called the police, but as I started back down the steps to the basement, he made a sound that made me shudder. I charged down the stairs and loaded the syringe, and as he charged at me, spittle dripping down his chin as I attempted to plunge the syringe anywhere into his body. He crashed to the floor out of my reach. Suddenly there was a sound of people behind me. They were screaming to get back. One person who was not a policeman had a medical satchel. Ah, my brain deduced he must be a doctor. I tried to explain to him about the syringe and the antidote. The poor crazed man jumped back up and with a power not human, he threw himself at the locked door. The cage tipped over, an undiscernible noise from the bowels of his soul curdled. He moaned, he whimpered, and then he wretched and died. <laughs> you know, I am glad of one thing about that night. I didn't drink the yellow liquid. <laughs> and now, a word from our sponsors at EFG Shirts. I am wearing my Dr. Gould t-shirt. If you would like to buy one, call 650-678-1020 and I will personally respond to your needs. And now it is my turn to share a tale. Witches are my friends most of the time, like Van in particular was a pest for many years. She nearly killed me with some of her delightful pastries that she had laced with rat killer. Now I agree, at times, I can be a little bit like a rat, but this is merely a technique to stay alive. This bitch had lulled me into thinking she was my friend. She was patient and kept bringing me really good baked goods. After a couple of years of this attention, I let my guard down, which is very unlike me. I had no idea she despised me. You see, we had a history of what I was not aware of. Her father was a Hispanic, a powerful warlock, with a mean streak about him that was out of his control. 
He would cast spells on anyone who crossed him. He rarely took a life. One time this warlock harmed a close friend of mine and left him for dead on the beach in Mexico. I was visiting my friend at the time, as luck would have it. I found him on the beach, and with barely a pulse, I took my friend to his home and had a very good friend watch over him. I pursued the warlock and found him at his estate, sleeping in a hammock, soaking up the sun. I had can't be seen with me, who has no patience for anyone who has the need to harm others. Can't be seen before I could stop him, flip the warlock out of the hammock, and the two were toe to toe instantly. Can't be seen has a very bad body for fighting because of his burns from the fire. He survived as a teenager, so then the warlock pulled a knife out. I had no choice but to assist Can't be seen. This warlock, as I said, was very powerful, both mentally and physically. I punched him in the Adam's apple with a straight knuckle shot. To my surprise, I had crushed the warlock's windpipe. He staggered and fell dying nearly as soon as he hit the ground. I had no idea he had a family. His only daughter was the bitch that had poisoned me. After I recovered, I found the bitch. She had heard that I survived and went into hiding. Then I went to where she had she was hiding. She was very frightened. I explained to her in detail that I had no intention of killing her father. I showed real remorse for what had happened. She believed me, and we have been friends for a couple of years now. Yes, I have many witches who are my friends, and one whose father I killed. <laughs> a chilling reminder to all. History can be a killer. <laughs> well, another great show. The stories you can share with your friends. I must thank Scrog and Slasher Poe for their tales. They were delightful. To Chop Block TV, another great job with our graphics. So until next time, my fiendish friends. May all your dreams be nightmares. <laughs>